There are four words in the Bible that we translate repent. Two Hebrew words and two Greek words. Okay, there was a paradox that developed in the church. And that was when the Roman emperor required that everyone, including Christians, worship him as God. Okay, so lots of people did that for whatever reason. They had families, they wanted to stay alive, they didn't want the emperor to have them killed. Uh, they wanted to be able to get jobs, they wanted to be able to work. There are all kinds of ways em the emperor could punish people for not worshiping him. So some of the believers worshiped the emperor. Others of them stayed faithful to the Lord and wouldn't worship the emperor. Well, the people that stayed faithful to the Lord paid dearly. Some of them were killed. Some of them were uh, maimed, hurt, tortured, uh, children killed, all kinds of horrific things. All right, so the faithful paid a price for being faithful. The people that worshiped the emperor uh, were rewarded for worshiping the emperor. Okay, then as time passed, that emperor moved on, and the believers that had worshiped the emperor came to the church and wanted to rejoin the church. Well, the church is in a quandary now because the people left in the church were the faithful people, the people that had suffered greatly, had loved ones killed, had children killed. And so for the church to carte blanche say, you're forgiven for worshiping the emperor, come on in, that would have been a grievous insult to the believers that had paid such a heavy price for not worshiping the emperor. So in order to satisfy the requirements of those who'd paid so much for being faithful, the church came up with the idea of uh, having them work for forgiveness or paying a price for their sin. So that's when the idea of penances came up. And so they would have people do things like um, on Sundays, they would have the people that had worshipped uh, the emperor lay across the threshold of the church. Then the faithful would step over them, coming into the church to prove they hadn't worshipped the emperor, but these other people did, and they're paying a price. There were all kinds of things, prayer and fasting, extra prayers, service to the church, and the whole idea, follow this everybody, the whole idea was spiritual superiority and spiritual inferiority. All right? So, as you know, it's very difficult to establish that if you really believe and practice the gospel because we're all saved by grace through faith. We are all purchased with a price that we did not earn. It is a free gift. We have no reason to boast for the grace that's in us. All right, so the established, the, 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 this practice of causing the people that had worshipped the emperor to pay a price for their sins established the idea of you have to do certain works to earn grace. You have to perform a certain way to prove to us all that you're humble. You have to do certain things to prove to us that you've really repented. All right. Everybody follow that, yes or no? Isn't that interesting? Say, that's very interesting. Oh, yeah, that is interesting. All right. Now, here's what followed that. The Pope was concerned that there were so many translations of the Bible out there that there was confusion in the church. So the Pope commissioned Jerome to make a translation of the Bible and let that translation be the universal translation for the Western church. At that time, it was a Catholic church. All right, so that translation was made. It's a very good translation. He did a great job with the exception of one word. And that one word, it was, it was the most popular Greek word, the Greek word used the most time in the New Testament that's translated repentance. He didn't translate it repentance. He translated it be penitent. Or in other words, in other words, you've got to do works 
to earn the grace of God. You've got to do things to prove to other people you're humble in order to be redeemed. So it changed the meaning of the New Testament. All, and it, it lasts to this day. That's why to this day, if you go down to St. Mary's and go to confession, they will say afterward, you need to do three Hail Marys and 50 hours of community service. Oh, no, that's a different group. <laughs> All right. All right. When they say that, what they're doing is they're saying repentance alone does not merit God's favor. Now, when the Reformation happened, we rejected the idea of working for grace because grace is a free gift from God. Okay, so we rejected it, but we didn't reject it in practice. And so to this day, you can look at a Catholic church or a Protestant church when somebody does something wrong, the leaders will say, how do we know if you're really repentant? And you got to show us. You got to prove to it. And they will pick. There's no place in the scripture that says how long you should be punished or how much punishment should come. Actually, there's no place in the scripture that says you should be punished. Now, society may require that you be punished if you've broken the law. Culture may require that you be punished if you violated your family or violated your marriage or violated your children or violated your neighborhood. So we have lots of institutions that punish, but it is not the church's role to do that. It is the church's role to heal people. <clears throat> it is the church's role to redeem people. It's the church's role to make sure people can be okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So there started to be a confusion of roles. Why? It's because in many areas, when this started happening with the Catholic Church, which we sprang out of, when this started to happen, in many areas, the Catholic Church was the government. And so the way they would keep order was through this system of people paying for God's grace, people needing to do something to appropriate God's grace. Okay, so... With this being in mind, one of, one of the Free Methodist larger churches had a board member that got a DUI. They called the bishop about it. This was a, a successful board member, important to the church. And the bishop said, well, he's going to have to get off the board and he's going to have to go through a process. They called the superintendent about it. The superintendent said the same thing. Then, a little while later, the superintendent and the bishop were talking to one another on the phone, and they brought up this issue with this board member. All right, so they both said, let's call Ted Haggard and see what he thinks. It's always a mistake. <laughs> they called me, and I said, well, tell me about the board member. They talked about this lovely guy in the Lord who is awesome in every way who was so embarrassed about what had happened, he regretted he did not want that kind of lifestyle to be his life. And so when they described this to me, I said, why do you need to do anything? It sounds to me like the Holy Spirit's already done it. It sounds to me like God, God is on the throne. And isn't this the process every one of us go through? His happened to be a public thing because he got caught driving. But, I mean, we all go through this. This is part of growing from glory to glory. So why don't you just encourage him? Don't take him off the board. Why embarrass his kids? Why embarrass his family? Why put him through that? Do, he doesn't have to pay for God's grace. All right. So they said, well, that would be different than our protocol. <laughs> Will people think we're endorsing drunkenness. I said, you got to be kidding me. You really think that people would misunderstand your mercy and grace with you endorsing negative behavior. I said, we are not that important to people. People aren't thinking about us that much. And, and the only time people are going to be interested is if you switch roles and start being the accuser of the brethren or start being the district attorney and make sure they're prosecuted, or start being a journalist and make them stand up in front of the church and tell everybody the most sordid details. If those are your roles, do it that way. But if you are the church, 
Let the blood of Jesus be applied. Let the Holy Spirit work within. Let new life be birthed out of this process. And let there be wonderful reason to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus inside that guy. All right, they said, well, we've never done this before quite like this, but we'll see if it works. Now, I don't know how you measure that. But, <clears throat> so they had a board meeting. The board member was there, and he said, I know the purpose of this meeting, and I just want you to know I'll do whatever you say. I'll step down. I'll leave the church if you think I'm going to be an embarrassment. I'll do whatever. We are so embarrassed, and I'm just so ashamed of what happened. And the pastor said to the rest of the board, is there anybody here that is without sin? All right. That was a shock. So one of the board members that's spiritually superior said, yes, but aren't we sending a public message? It's been in the newspaper. Aren't we sending a public message that we endorse drunk driving? The pastor said, we might be sending a public message that we forgive drunk driving. So the guy burst into tears. And he said, so what does this mean for me? And the guy who was concerned about publicly endorsing drunk driving turned to him and said, what it might mean for you is that you are forgiven by the Lord and forgiven by the church, and we're here to protect you and defend you. Yeah. All right, that guy went home and told his wife about what had happened. Unusually, I know wives never do this typically. Unusually, the wife called all the kids, they're grown, and told them what had happened at the church. For the first time in the history of that family, the next Sunday, the husband, the wife, all their kids, spouses, and grandkids were there. Wow. They started celebrating what had happened, and that was in Deer Flat Church where Gail and I just did a conference. You ought to see what's going on out there. They can't build buildings fast enough. And the turning point happened when they used someone else's sin as an opportunity to model the gospel. Yeah. Rather than using somebody else's sin as a point of shame and embarrassment. God revealed his heart by sending Jesus to rescue us from our sin. We reveal our hearts when we rescue someone else from their sin. To the degree that we are self-righteous is the degree that we will use somebody else's sin for punishment and judgment. To the degree that we know that Christ and Christ alone is our righteousness is the degree that we respond to somebody else's sin redemptively and with a healing touch. You hear it? All right. So it's a very, very different worldview, everybody. So when somebody comes into my office and talks about a weakness, a failure, an embarrassment, a heartbreak, I'm encouraged because it's an opportunity to model the gospel. Yeah. 